and we're live. Uh, hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Stanford MLSYS seminar series. This is the second episode. We're back with you again. Um, we have, uh, I'm Karan, we have with us Dan, uh, Piero, Piero, and Matei, who are all the co organizers of this uh, seminar series. Um, this week, we're going to be talking with Matei uh, Zaharia, who's also a co organizer, about um, some of the work that he's been doing at actually taking machine learning into industry uh, with MLflow and at Databricks. Um, and he's going to tell us like some of the lessons that he's learned there. And uh, after that, we'll have audience questions. So the format, uh, as always, is going to be a half an hour talk where Matei tells us um, about um, working with ML in industry. And then after that, the audience can ask questions and you can um, uh, we'll, we'll direct those questions to Matei and, uh, and have a discussion podcast style with him. Um, during the talk, if you do have questions, feel free to post them. We'll keep track of what you're saying in chat. Um, and if there's a clarification or confusion, we'll try to get that across to Matei um, so that um, he can take those questions as well. Um, so let me introduce Matei. Matei is a assistant professor of computer science at Stanford. He's chief technologist at Databricks. Um, he actually started Apache Spark during uh, his PhD at Berkeley in 2009, and he's been working on um, looking at like cluster computing and analytic software, including MLflow, which we'll talk about today. Um, he's also a co-PI of Dawn at Stanford, which is a lab that's been doing research around like more infrastructure for machine learning. Um, and his work has been like recognized by the ACM with the doctoral dissertation, NSF Career Award, US Presidential Early Career Award. So he's done some really great work and we're very excited to see what he has for us today at the cutting edge of machine learning and industry. So um, take it away, Matei. All right, thanks a lot, Karan. Let me just share my screen here. Um, okay, great, you can see that, right? Yeah, we can see your screen. Everything looks good. Okay, great. Yeah, so for this talk, I wanted to basically just put on my industry hat for a bit and give an industry uh, perspective on how companies are using machine learning. Uh, and in particular, the kind of challenges they have that are very different from what you might see in machine learning research or in uh, courses at university and so on. So I just wanna give people ideas of what's out there. There's actually a lot of activity in this space as people try to figure out how to solve these problems. And I think it can also lead to interesting research in systems for machine learning. But you know, I'm gonna uh, come at it from the um, uh, industry perspective. Um, and so, so basically I'll talk about challenges using machine learning in industry. Um, I'll, and I, I mostly wanna talk about this concept of ML platforms as an emerging abstraction or a kind of software that uh, many companies are building uh, to solve these challenges. And I'll talk about an example of this, which is MLflow, it's an open source project uh, started by Databricks. It's also, um, there's also a version of it that's uh, hosted into a cloud service that, that Databricks provides. Um, and the final thing I'll talk about is some interesting ways that people are using MLflow. It's actually uh, become a very widely used uh, project uh, with, with uh, you know, over 2 million downloads per month and, uh, you know, many tens of thousands of uh, users. So, um, uh, so I'm, uh, we've seen a lot of interesting things that people do with that. Um, and my perspective here is mostly from the time that I spent at Databricks. Uh, it's, uh, th this is a, a data and machine learning uh, cloud platform company. Um, uh, and it has about 7,000 customers across AWS and Azure. And it's running on a pretty significant scale, definitely similar in scale to a lot of the cloud providers, data and ML services. So these customers are running you know, together millions of VMs. Uh, that we manage and they have hundreds of thousands of users on the platform. Um, so I put some examples of the kind of companies that uh, that um, Databricks worked with. It's, it's really trying to um, uh, make data and ML accessible to enterprises in, you know, in, in kind of all fields. And you can see there are companies ranging from telecom to industrial, retail, uh, healthcare, um, and so on. So one of the things I wanted to, to start with is, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, machine learning is at an early stage in industry adoption and so on. And it is true in that there could be a lot more applications, but 
at the same time, uh, it's, it has already been adopted for uh, some very critical applications. And these are the kind of things that I think you have to consider when you design systems, uh, you know, for companies to use for something that's not just like, you know, a personal assistant on your phone or, or something like that. So here are three examples of how people are using machine learning. So. Uh, first of all, Nationwide uh, is an is a insurance company in the U.S. that was founded in 1926. So its core business is setting insurance policies, and it's going to be profitable or not profitable based on how well, you know, it, it, uh, it prices those policies. Then, and that's like all that it does, right? There's there are whole teams there of statisticians and uh, people who come up with these. Um, and, you know, one of the things that they're doing now is trying to price some of these insurance insurance policies based on machine learning. So you can imagine, you know, and this it's something where being off by a little bit and the results from machine learning or not, but you know, not understanding what it's going to do uh, can can sort of tank the company if you don't do it well. Uh, it's not just kind of a side project that someone has. Um, another example in a lot of these industrial companies, they're managing uh, inventory and uh, supply chains uh, using machine learning models. And again, these things actually like directly affect the cost and revenue that you're going to get. You know, with some of these like chemicals and things, storing them is very expensive. Uh, with with some uh, types of uh, you know industrial materials, that they're actually going to degrade over time. Um, and you know, you can't like stash them away. You have to actually have a supply chain that flows, uh, uh, you know, continuously, um, and that you know lets the company keep producing its products. Um, and then another place I'm sure people are familiar with is in any kind of financial company. There are use cases like fraud detection and personalization. Obviously, they directly lead to monetary loss or gain for that company. And these companies often have um, hundreds of petabytes of data uh, that they use for it. And the other really interesting factor in these is that there's also very um, strict regulation about what they can do. So they have to be able to show, like if someone audits them, they have to be able to show that, you know, they're not, uh, per, you know, personalizing offers or pricing or whatever uh, in, a, in an illegal way. So that adds, you know, further uh, constraints on what they can do with machine learning. Okay, so that's you know what it's being used for, and obviously, like in some sense, the if, if you're interested in ML systems to, uh, to to let more people build you know machine learning applications, you know these are the ones I showed are the kinds of applications and companies that uh, you probably want to enable, right? To to, to let them do things with ML. But at the same time, uh, it turns out that developing and deploying machine learning is uh, quite different from traditional software, and it's, it's often uh, quite a bit harder. So I just want to point out some of the differences uh, that you run into. So first of all, there's the goal. What are you trying uh, to do with it? Uh, with traditional software, like when you build some kind of business application, the goal is usually to meet a functional specification. And it's it's basically a Boolean goal. Either you met it or you didn't. For example, when you press this button, you know, does it send an email to the person or does it delete the calendar event or whatever? So it's it's simple to understand and also kind of simple to check whether it's working. Um, with machine learning, on the other hand, in most cases, the goal is to optimize some kind of metric like prediction accuracy, and you're never really done. There are always ways uh, to maybe make that better. So it's a continuous iterative process. You want to keep experimenting and, you know, every like 0.1% you can squeeze out of it by doing something new uh, might uh, lead you to, to gain something. Um, so that's one difference. Um, the second difference is what affects the quality uh, of the thing you build. So with traditional software, the quality basically uh, only depends on the application code that's in there. So if you have people review the code, uh, you know, if you test the code and so on, uh, you're, you're pretty sure that it's, it's going to work okay. Uh, with machine learning, by definition, you're writing algorithms that learn from data. So the quality also depends a lot on the input data um, and also on these kind of more subtle things like tuning parameters uh, that you can also view as a form of data. Um, and, you know, unlike the code, uh, which, you know, maybe a human can review, uh, you can't really review all the data or all the weights in a model. So that, that also makes it harder. 
Uh, and then another interesting difference that you see a, a lot in practice is um, in terms of the amount of software tools that you have to combine to, to make something work. So in traditional software, you usually just pick one software stack. Like you pick one database, you're gonna use you know, one web framework, maybe you use Django um, and uh, you know, one JavaScript framework and, and you're sort of done. Uh, but with machine learning, because it's this process where you're constantly uh, trying to experiment and to optimize some metric, ideally, you actually want an environment where you can combine many libraries, algorithms, data sources, and so on for the same task. Um, and that can also complicate things if you, you know, if you don't do it carefully. So these are some ways that it's different just to, to develop these things. Um, and then when you, if you've actually built, you know, a good machine learning model and you want to productionize it and deploy it, um, that brings additional problems. Uh, basically, the first problem is that you have to have all this process of collecting data, uh, updating the model, uh, and then putting it in the application. It has to happen continuously because you'll want to keep it up to date with new data. And the second challenge, uh, which ties into my last point is that uh, often there are quite a few different people or systems involved um, who have to pass this model or this data between them uh, for it to get deployed. So uh, there are many opportunities for something to go wrong in that handoff process. Okay, so that's a little bit of what's um, difficult uh, about machine, about using machine learning for these applications where you need to be really reliable. Um, so to solve these problems, there's actually been a, a very strong trend um, around this concept of ML platforms. So companies are designing software that manages the ML development and deployment process, and they try to span as much of the end to end process as possible from data to experimentation and to production. And a lot of companies have written about platforms that they built internally. Uh, for example, all these large web companies have platforms like TFX at Google, uh, and FB Learner at Facebook and so on. Uh, but we found that you know, companies of all sizes were building something that they call an ML platform internally. So it's a, it's a very common term and, and something that people think about as they build these applications. And these usually have a number of concerns. You can kind of decide which ones to put in the platform, but uh, things like data management, experiment management, you know, model management, um, and also these, uh, these processes for deployment, for reproducing results and for testing and monitoring. And the key goal of these platforms is to give you like a, a programming interface that's consistent where if people work against that interface, it's easy for someone else to take their model and manage it or combine it with another model or update the data to point to some new data and so on. Uh, so it really is like a programming interface uh, kind of question to design these. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's happening. Um, and so we started looking at this problem in 2018, and that's when we started the, the MLflow project that I'll talk about. And basically what, what we saw, we wanted to add a little bit on top of what's out there. So we saw that um, uh, companies were just designing their own platforms at that point. And they were usually just adding the few things that they need for you know, their first ML applications to work well. So that would mean it supports only a few libraries, it only supports a few deployment environments. And that also means that the team that maintains the platform often became a bottleneck because you know, if you tell all the uh, ML people in the company, you have to use TensorFlow, uh, there are definitely gonna be some who read a paper and you know, the paper is using some other framework and they say, can you add this into the platform too? Because I think it will improve that metric by you know, 1% or whatever. So, so this was kind of a bottleneck. So basically the MLflow project came out of us asking, um, how do we provide these kind of benefits, but in an open platform, ideally one that, you know, a lot of people can write connectors to so that you don't have to replicate uh, this process of designing the platform everywhere else. Um, so that's basically what, um, what we built in this project. We made it an open source project. And we have, in terms of design, you know, it's a lot of the components you'll see in other platforms, uh, but uh, it's based on what we call a open interface design philosophy, which is make it very easy to connect arbitrary um, machine learning code and tools that you have into the platform. In fact, a lot of people connect proprietary tools. So things we don't even have the source code of, we make sure the APIs are modular enough that they can hook up the existing system with it and still get the benefits uh, from the things that we do provide. 
Um, so that's like one, you know, kind of design insight, I guess, that, that we have to think about. Um, and the concrete way to do that is uh, we try to organize everything around just command, cam command line tools and REST APIs that you can call from anywhere you run code. So you don't have to be tied to a specific environment and just make it easy to add to existing software. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what it provides and give some examples to show you uh, how these things are built. Um, and uh, in particular in MLflow right now, there are four components. Um, it has uh, something called tracking for experiment and data management uh, projects, which is a way to just package up your code so someone else can run it. Um, models, which is a, a model packaging uh, format uh, that's designed to let you easily send the same model into different places. Uh, and it's got a component called the model registry, which is a little bit like a GitHub or collaborative hub for sharing and working on uh, models and reviewing them. Uh, so these are the built-in components. And it's also got a whole bunch of connectors to various uh, machine learning libraries, most of which were written by uh, you know, other people in the open source community who added them uh, into the project as they were using these tools. So let me just show a little bit of how these work to give you a sense. So actually often the first place people start using this is for experiment tracking because there you solve an immediate problem that like the machine learning modeler has, you know, even in organizations where the people doing the modeling are not the people who deploy to production, uh, they still wanna use a platform to make their life easier just doing modeling. And then it kind of nudges them into doing something where um, actually life becomes easier for everyone else involved in the application too. Um, so let's think about like how you'll track experiments. So th certainly the easiest way to do it is you have your machine learning code and you just use some print statements or you know maybe you put stuff in a TensorBoard directory or something like that. Uh, and then you end up with this big log of like everything you run. Uh, but I'm sure everyone who's done this before has run into problems with it. So you wonder, you know, what if I tune some other parameter that I wasn't recording before? Uh, what if I upgrade my library? You know, how, how can I, you know, track which results came from which library? Uh, and it's very hard to tell what version of your code and environment each result was from. And so you get into a lot of trouble later when you try to, uh, to compare or rebuild these results. So with, with MLflow tracking, it's basically just a simple REST API that you can call from your code to record various information. And there are also convenience wrappers for a lot of uh, libraries that just intercept the calls to them and automatically log stuff. So for example, if you were using Keras here, you could just add this one call and we would log everything that uh, you can listen to in Keras. Uh, or if you want, you can also log custom information. You know, if you have your own stuff or your, your own custom machine learning library. And then um, this will log stuff to a server uh, basically. And then you can launch uh, this user interface that shows you uh, all the experiment runs that you did. And there's also a simple API to load that back into a data frame and compare all the results. So it's very simple. It's just a database of what you ran, uh, but it, uh, it makes it a lot easier to track what was happening. And it's easy to extend it to log additional stuff. And once you've got uh, this interface, you can easily inspect the individual runs, you can add notes on them, uh, you can add arbitrary files into them and, and, and so on uh, to, um, uh, you know, to keep track of what you were doing and you can share them with someone else. Okay. Uh, second component projects um, is, uh, is, is just a packaging format. So it's basically a way to say, you know, when I, I have my machine learning code, here's the environment it depends on. It could be Conda or Docker. And here are the parameters and the way to call it. And the key thing is that it gives you the standard way to run a project regardless of, you know, what language was used to build at what library and so on. So you can create workflows with modular steps that you can replace. Um, now, the, the, the third component models is actually more interesting and kind of weird. Um, so it's a little bit like projects, it's a generic format, but it's for packaging models from any library. And the thing that's different here from, um, from formats like Onyx, for example, or you know, TensorFlow, Serialized Model or whatever, is that in the format, you can define multiple interfaces to the model called flavors. So you can have a model, for example, you log, and it can be accessible as 
Onyx for tools that understand Onyx, but also as a Python function for tools that just understand Python. And that means that you can plug in a lot of downstream tools, right? So some tools will just naively call it as a Python function, things like maybe running it in a Docker container or in a Spark job. Uh, and other tools might be able to inspect the weights or do something fancy with them, like maybe some of the um, interpretability tools. Um, so it's it's sort of weird, but um, it's uh, it, it's a it's an interesting kind of concept where the same model can have different interfaces. And if you want to look into the format, you know you can read about it. But basically, uh, it's just a directory with this YAML file that tells you uh, that has different information for each of these flavors. Uh, and again, the ecosystem around that there are sort of dozens of different connectors that let you uh, deploy the model in different ways. Uh, and then the final component uh, is the model registry. Um, so this is, as I said, it's this environment for organizing and reviewing models. And by default, whenever you run uh, an experiment and you use tracking, um, it's, there's a button on that UI that lets you easily publish this uh, into the model registry or make basically the equivalent of a pull request to update an existing model. Um, and it's also got APIs where you can plug in automated tools like continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment tools. Um, so the way that looks is again, very simple. It's it, you've got a bunch of models in there and for each model you've got versions of it and it's got this concept of stages. So you can decide which model is in production, you know, which one is in testing, which one is archived and so on. Um, and it's also got this concept of a transition request, which is a little bit like a pull request where you can ask the move it and then you can have an automated um, script that listens to that and, and does something about the change or you can have human reviewers or whatever process that you want. Okay, so that's basically what it's like. It's, uh, you know, I hope it's given you a sense of like why and how we designed it and what problems it solves. Uh, and as I said, it's a, it's a pretty large and fast growing uh, project. We were actually really excited with the number of companies that used it and contributed to it. So uh, we have uh, about 250 contributors to the project and um, uh, it's going about a factor of four year on year. And um, uh, just on uh, Databricks itself, we have about a million experiment runs per week and 100,000 models um, registered uh, into that registry where people are doing the reviewing and so on. Okay, so that's an example of a ML platform. Um, and then the, 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 the other thing I wanna talk about is how companies are using this and what you can kind of learn from there uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, new, new directions to go in as you design systems. And even within MLflow, there's a lot of stuff it doesn't do yet. And hopefully you can think about some ways you might extend it to, to, to do more things while, while sticking to that philosophy that it's got. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about sort of the obvious ways people are, are using it and some of the non-obvious things that we learn. So we had a whole bunch of expected use cases and we do see a lot of them um, uh, at users. So tracking experiments, doing model design, that's actually often the entry point for people. And as I said, it's nice because it, then it, uh, it uh, puts everything in a format where the, um, uh, the, the, the deployment engineers can, can easily use. Uh, so that's a nice benefit of it. Uh, tracking performance of a model as you keep retraining it and deploying it. So, you know, once you built it once, uh, you want to set up some kind of scheduled job that's going to update it. And if your code is all, already instrumented to record all these metrics and stuff, you can, uh, you can just query those from the database as the job is running and see how they're changing over time. Um, deploying the same model in different environments like batch and real time. Um, running pipelines in different environments, um, and finally, uh, continuous integration and deployment with the model registry. So these, you know, I would say there are like basically, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of companies in, in each of these that, that uh, we see uh, just in our cloud service. Um, there are also some really interesting use cases that came out um, uh, that um, I wanted to highlight. And one of these that I don't see a lot of people talk about in, uh, in research at least, is the use case of having a massive number of models. Um, so this comes up um, quite often actually, and it's basically when a company wants to train a separate model for each entity they're working with. It could be a facility they have, it could be one of their customers like a company, uh, it could be like a machine and a chemical processing plant and so on. Um, and it, it often happens when you have a lot of data for each of these entities, like, you know, a lot of time series. 
Um, so it seems a little bit uh, weird to do this in some ways, but there are some nice benefits. One of them is that you avoid interference across these entities. So you know that if there's like a faulty sensor in one chemical plant, for example, you're not gonna, it's not gonna mess up your model and then mess up your predictions for all the other sensors or all the other chemical plants or whatever the entities are. Um, so that's uh, one benefit. Uh, and then the other interesting benefit is that you preserve privacy or regulatory compliance uh, because uh, you're not supposed, you're not allowed to mix data from different things. So just some examples of like kind of people who talked about this in some public talks, you can find them online um, from Exxon Mobil. They, they do this for basically each device uh, in, uh, you know, in, in various um, uh, kinds of uh, chemical plants uh, so that they can have a model just for that device. Um, QB is a company in Europe that like gives households information about how they're using energy and how they could save money or uh, power in their household. So they have a lot of time series from each household and, uh, and they, they use this approach to manage sort of millions of models. Um, and then another one we've seen is um, uh, enterprise software companies that have a lot of customers and they want to have machine learning features in the product, but they can't, um, they don't want to learn something across customers. Like, you know, imagine you work at uh, Pepsi and there's an autocomplete as you're writing an email and it autocompletes with stuff that they learned from Coca-Cola. Uh, and then you learn some trade secret of Coca-Cola from that, that would be bad. Um, so this is a, and you know, these, these will have like thousands of customers uh, that they have to build these for. Uh, so the solution is there's what I'm calling like hands-free machine learning. Basically um, you, you write a script that will do the machine learning, but you don't tune it separately for each entity. You just train mi millions of these models in parallel potentially. And this is a common use case for auto ML as well. You, you design a little auto ML library that you run on each one. And then you just look at aggregate statistics of these uh, models. Uh, uh, so you might query them uh, you know, as a data frame or something, and you might see, hey, which sensors am I doing the worst on or which customers or whatever. Uh, and then it's all automated. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And, but it, it is in some sense like where people want to get to, I think, because even when you have a single model, you'd prefer that you don't have to maintain it all the time. So this is a way to make sure that like what's coming out of this process is like pretty decent, at least locally in each place. Um, okay. Uh, another um, uh, interesting use case uh, that we've seen uh, is using uh, tools like MLflow, but for just experiment tracking that isn't part of machine learning, like just experiments in your business uh, or in, in some kind of data science uh, thing that you're doing. Uh, so for example, um, we've had um, uh, uh, some users who um, uh, use the, the model registry, but instead of building models, they're actually like just designing and reviewing and publishing visualizations uh, because they're going to share, their, uh, share them inside this hospital, Seattle's um, Children's Hospital. Uh, and they wanna make sure that the visualizations are actually accurate and you know, they get reviewed and they're not changing too much in a, in a weird way day to day. So they're using it to, to manage basically data science and reporting results. Um, and another interesting one, this Hyperloop One uh, uh, use case is they're trying to design this Hyperloop system and they have a simulator and they have these like hundreds of engineering things they can tune about it. You know, how many seats are in the car? How many stations are there? You know, what kind of battery is it using? All these kinds of things. And so they run and compare the results of these simulations. Um, so it sort of makes sense in general that for like a data-driven um, kind of use case, you would want something like this. Uh, but I haven't seen too much research on, on this kind of stuff. Uh, and then the final thing that I think is interesting is when people want, um, why people want reproducibility and explainability. So in a lot of cases, it's actually coming because of regulation. Um, so for example, if you're a government regulator, like someone that has to find fraud maybe in, uh, you know, in how people are trading stocks or buying things or whatever, uh, or if you're a highly regulated company, uh, then you need your, your process, your machine learning or whatever analytics process to give results that will stand up in court basically. So these have requirements, like I wanna document every piece of data and code that went into a result. In fact, a lot of these that we talked with have even built custom systems to do this. Uh, they want models to be explainable. Uh, and they also, in some cases we've seen, they use auto ML because they wanna argue in court that they use best practices and they had no side information or anything that led them to make a decision. They just took an off the shelf 
best practice and got that model. And that's why, you know, they bought that stock or whatever it is that they did. Um, so kind of an interesting reason why people are using these. Okay, so that's a quick tour of like what I've seen and what I thought was interesting. Um, just to conclude, uh, you know, machine learning is being used in pretty critical problems uh, and it requires careful management. It's especially interesting if you're looking at when there are regulations about how to use data. Um, I think this concept of ML platforms is, is really important and it's a pretty open uh, design space. Our approach was this open interface approach to do it. Um, and there are quite a few problems here. And, uh, you know, I hope this is something that uh, researchers will be interested in as well. So thanks and I am happy to take questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Matei. Thanks. That was a great talk and thanks for taking us over a boot. Why I can't hear you actually. Oh, sorry. Can, uh, can you hear us? Um, uh, I can hear you, Karan. Okay. Uh, so, Mate, can you hear me? Yeah, I couldn't hear Karan. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can. Okay, great, perfect. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, just a reminder to the audience that you can start to send in more questions. Um, we're keeping track of the chat and we'll um, relay those to Mate. Um, so just to get us, um, I guess, started, um, a lot of people in chat seem to be interested in comparisons between what you are offering in MLflow. You talked a little bit about the open interface design philosophy and how that compares, I guess, to other frameworks and libraries. So I think Lamia Yusuf mm -hmm. said, okay, how do, how do you compare or complement to Kubeflow? Uh, Roberto Maridzi was wondering about TFX. I think Shreya Rajpal was wondering about MLflow versus weights and biases. So there's a lot of these tools out there. So in general, like how should people mm -hmm. think about this landscape? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about each of them in particular. I think um, as far as I know, like um, uh, MLflow is the, the only one that uh, really focuses on these collaboration aspects like the model registry and uh, review uh, of, uh, of results and so on. Uh, to some extent, some of the features around tracking as well. Uh, so, some of the other platforms are more focused on kind of the nuts and bolts of how to deploy stuff. So I think those are, even though people are calling them both ML platforms, they're aiming to do slightly different things. Both are useful. Um, but I, for example, I think Kubeflow is really about how do I easily deploy lots of stuff on Kubernetes and connect them together. And it's just these components that exist. Whereas we say, look, you're gonna run code anywhere. We're not gonna um, bother you with a specific way of running the code. You know, Maybe you don't have Kubernetes, maybe you already have it you know, and you're managing it yourself. Uh, but within that code, how do you enable like sharing model exchange uh, and collaboration on it? So we, we tried to, to keep out of like how you actually run uh, the stuff. But so for example, things like the model format we have with many flavors or the registry, there aren't really things like that in, in most of those other systems. Yeah, but but then, uh, it's, a, it's a new space, right? So there are always gonna be a lot of new things in here. Matei, one other dimension that our viewers are really interested in is versioning. So mm -hmm. can you give us some more flavor on how, how does both versioning of the model works and how, um, in particular, how does it manage the maybe changes in the connectors or maybe changes in the interface of some of the models? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, let me just show, can I show a few slides for that? Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, one second. I'll, I'll just go back to some of these to explain something. So, so there's a few pieces. So I guess one of them is like within the system, how do you version things? So um, as I was showing, actually, I guess I was showing, oops, I was showing here. Um, so for a given model, we have a concept of multiple versions and we also have these stages. So for example, like production and the, in the API that you used to read a model, you know, the stages, think of them a little bit like a branch in Git. So you can say, I want to read airline delay model slash production or slash staging. And it's always going to load that one. Like when you have a job that loads the model to do inference. Um, so that's how you, uh, you can link to the specific ones. Now within the model, how do you make sure it's reproducible? This is where this um, packaging format um, comes in. So uh, in the, I didn't show it in this example, but the packaging format includes things like a Conda environment or a Docker image, like it includes the software environment you need to run, 
to run this. And it also includes inside it, you can have, um, you of course have the weights of the model. Uh, so you can stand up the same version of it. And one reason we have different flavors is like some of them, you know, if you're just gonna view this as like a Python process, you better set up a Docker container to get that environment. But if the model exposed Onyx, which is already a portable format, then there are tools that can just load that and maybe they can be more efficient. Um, and we want you to be agnostic of like what the downstream tools can understand. So you can switch between the different types of models. I think there was a follow-up in this about um, whether there's um, things that you have for privacy and, and and also like when you promote a model uh, and what happens if it belongs to different accounts in the organization and things like that. I'm yeah, just... that, that's a great question. Yeah, I think that de depends a lot on how you uh, want to configure access controls. So um, um, so we have like, for example, in the, in the Databricks hosted version of it, there's an access control model for the whole platform where you have a concept of groups and users and you can apply it to data sets notebooks, models, and so on. Um, and so you can use that to, to limit the groups. Um, but um, you, if, if, you, you know, if you want, you could also uh, plug in a different uh, way of doing this. Uh, I think that's a big, I mean, th there's a lot to be done there, especially as these rules around uh, ways you can use data, purpose of use, and so on are coming out. So uh, I think it's still kind of an evolving area. Mate, so a few, a uh, few of the viewers have questions about versioning of data sets. So yeah. one of the things when you're training machine learning models is even if you have to have all the same code, all the same architectures, yeah. all, all the same, all of that. If you change the data or have a, uh, or stale data, then, then the model does something very different. So how do you guys think about versioning data? Uh, data yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I was trying to see if I have a, a slide on that. So, so basically, um, so, so we didn't, inside MLflow, we don't provide a data versioning system, but it's easy to integrate it with, uh, with systems that do that. And um, the, the main one that uh, we work with at Databricks at least is the system called Delta Lake, which is basically a version table storage on top of cloud object stores like S3 or Google Cloud Storage. And uh, inside that we actually listen. So like I showed the auto log for uh, Keras that listens to API calls into Keras. We also have an auto log for uh, for Delta or for Spark actually that listens to any data source you're reading. So we can record, you know, which version of the data you read and uh, you, can, you can then run something against that same version. Um, uh, it, there are also other systems to manage this. Uh, you know, there are people who manage data using Git. We actually integrate with Git and we tell you which Git commit was used to run something. Uh, there's DVC, which is, um, it's got a sort of a similar interface to Git, but it's, it's designed to handle uh, larger data sets and machine learning in a better way. So we haven't built one ourselves, but we do want to integrate uh, with these. Um, and um, the, the other kind of data management that I didn't talk about, but is, uh, is super important is, um, is basically uh, kind of train uh, test differences and how you compute a feature. So there's this whole concept of feature stores. You can read, if you Google for like feature stores, you, you, there are quite a few uh, systems that have that. Um, and this is something we're looking at as well. We don't have like a, a standard uh, way to do this, but um, uh, but it, it might make sense to, to, to offer something here. And the, the goal there is like when I had some static data set in batch, and then when I'm trying to pull the same fields in production, how do I make sure I get the same ones? And maybe if I do some computation on them, how do I make sure that matches? Um, definitely the easiest way is if you have a data pipeline that publishes, that runs continuously and publishes a data set and you query it for both inference and uh, and training, but you can't always do that. So uh, that's why that's where this comes in. Yeah. So this idea of feature store is actually, you know, a good segue in actually a topic that I wanted that I was really curious about. Um, so you, for instance, you you talked about um, some you know other um, industry kind of um, platforms on open source platforms that company use. And when I was working at Uber, we had this platform called Michelangelo. Yeah. One of the main pieces of it was this feature store. And one of the advantages of having that is it helped in one of the aspects that you also touched upon, the fact that you may have very many models um, and um, in particular, those models may end up using different slices of data. For instance, one thing that we were doing was slicing in some cases based on the cities. 
And so you will have, you know, a model for one city, a model for another city, and so on and so on. My question is then, um, how are you thinking? This is a more high level mm -hmm. question, I would yeah. say. How are you thinking about the, you know, the trade-offs between the amount of data that you will get by doing this kind of slicing and the fact that actually you may want to have, in theory, the vast mo biggest amount of, of data possible to train your model. And where does, where, where do you draw the line, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think from the point of view of designing a platform, like we want to enable people to access all the data uh, that they want and, and explore it and see what they can build with it. Um, so, so that, so like, for example, all the, the data versioning stuff I talked about is designed to work with very large tabular data sets and on them, you can build things like partitioning and indexing to slice them into smaller ones. But from a modeling perspective, you know, this is, you know, I was talking about this with the many models, like there's some, um, you know, th there are some challenges with how you're going to combine stuff across them. And uh, sometimes it is nice to narrow things down a little bit. Uh, so I think this is an area like when people think about, for example, research on robust ML or something like that, uh, this is one, um, perspective you can throw in there. Like, how do I make it robust? You know, what if one of the cities is weird or what if one of the, you know, the, 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 uh, whatever the industrial machines that I'm monitoring is just faulty. How do I make sure I don't just learn garbage from that and apply it to everything else? Um, so yeah, I think I, I don't have a, a clear cut answer for it. I, I just, I think there'll be people who want to do uh, both of them, but yeah. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to at, at the platform level to allow for, I mean, user deciding whatever to do also because there could be other problems like i can imagine like um, um cold start problems where you have you know yeah. you a new cd or you embed a new machine and this new machine you don't have enough data for that so you may want to figure out some learnings from other machines that maybe are similar so i think that there's there's a lot of space there mm -hmm. for the interesting modeling things and the, the platform should allow for you know do everything really right yeah 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 and you want to figure out how to do it yeah so we're, we're just trying to basically we're saying, hey, whatever process you're using, we're just gonna kind of record what you did and make it easy for someone else to get it. We don't have an opinion about how you should model right now. Yeah. Um, another question that seems um, interesting uh, that came from a few people is about um, educating customers and users. Um, so I guess, um, yeah. how should people actually decide what is the right tool for them or the right framework for them to use? Um, and uh, more specifically, like, I think Kriya Shankar had this question about, uh, well, like the way that people actually use some of these tools can differ across organizations, right? Like some people may find that they're logging like all kinds of metrics and mm -hmm. later it's hard to sift through them versus maybe they should have done something different from the start, right? Um, so how do you kind of think about both like educating people on what they should use and also within that, what is like the right way to use the tool? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think the, like, honestly, uh, I mean, we, we have a few examples of how you can use it. And um, we also have a lot of like talks from users online from various like conferences and meetups and stuff like that. But uh, the, a lot of it does depend on your use case. So I would say, you know, you wanna see whether someone has done something similar uh, and, and how they did it. Um, I think it's also nice to have the flexibility to go back and, uh, and update things. So for example, if you're wondering like how many metrics should I log? Well, if your code is actually reproducible, then you can add more log statements and go back and on it. So uh, that's not too bad. Or if you logged a lot of stuff, you can filter it on the way out, like when you view it. Um, so I, I don't think there's like a, a standard way to do it, unfortunately. Uh, we found that usually like teams have a pretty good idea of what they wanna track, but they don't have, you know, if you're just a team of machine learning engineers, you don't wanna set up like a custom database and web front end and so on to, to monitor these things. Uh, so that's what we're trying to provide. And, and by making it kind of a standard one, uh, it, it comes in with this ecosystem of like lots of other tools that plug into it and also lots of people who know how to use it. Like, you know, maybe the engineer you're working with on deployment already knows how to use it. So that's kind of the, the reason behind trying to standardize this. Yeah. So we had a question uh, earlier on in the talk about whether customers like the UI or the, um, or the command line interfaces mm -hmm. more. And uh, this, this actually got me thinking a little bit. Uh, 
you, I, I think, you know, oftentimes the right interface for a specific thing that you're trying to do depends uh, a lot on where in the workflow you are and what type of workflow um, you're, you're kind of working on at the moment. So how do you think about MLflow in terms of uh, different workflows that, that people have and um, potentially as people invent new workflows or uh, workflows that might not fit into the traditional mm -hmm. model training workflows. How do you kind of think of those and, and anticipate those developments? Yeah, I think I think you're right. There, there are different workflows and there are also different users and the amount of time you want to spend to do something, is, you know, depends a lot on like what you're doing at that point. So, um, so we found that UI is actually important even for like the most advanced users whose only job is like to, to train models or to deploy models or whatever, um, because um, uh, it, it lets them uh, do those things faster and then, you know, maybe do more of it at the same time, like run more experiments or, um, uh, or uh, focus, you know, j just in the ones that they worry about. So we see, so, as, so again, you, you have to think about this, especially in the production mindset. So after you did some modeling, this thing is running there. And, you know, one day you notice that uh, it's getting lower quality results or something. So what do you do? So you want to quickly go in and inspect and see has something changed um, and, uh, and if so, what is it and, and fix it. Um, so I think UI is important for all the kinds of users and just in terms of like design philosophy for the, the tool, um, I think if you provide an API, people can always build custom stuff on top. So basically our approach is make sure there's an API where, you know, worst case, they can just query it or they can build something custom and then only add UI if there's strong evidence that like multiple people would use that and you want to maintain that in the future. Um, yeah, the, the other thing also in there is like, you know, it's like all basically even like, even though all the users are experts in modeling usually when they're doing machine learning, they're not experts in the systems things involved. So, so these are the ones, if you can hide those away, then that's, uh, that's very valuable. Um, so like a UI that has, you know, 20 machine learning metrics or like, uh, you know, parameter fitting curves or something uh, is much better than a UI that has like 20 Kubernetes parameters and like, you know, uh, metrics about CPU usage or something, right? Because because they, they know how to read the first one and not the second one. So that's the other factor to think about. Yeah. I'll tell you There's what. A question. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to add a follow up here that somebody posted. Piero, sorry. Uh, just related to what you were talking about, UI, Shreya Shankar wanted to know about the the whether like people are using um, UIs in different ways. Like the UI can get pretty cluttered. Like are different mm -hmm. serving different instances of UIs to MemoFlow and things like that. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I think if you if you have a lot of users, it might make sense to organize it into different instances. And that's one of the areas that I think we're, we're still working on. So we added tags to let you search. We're also trying to add new ways to visualize things. Because if you get a something with a lot of different metrics and runs, it can be hard to parse. So that's where there's always the fallback of API. So we see some people who just load it into pandas and then plot stuff that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think one interest, another interesting question that came up from the, just recently came up in the chat is again, another higher level question, which is um, what are the difficulties and what are the challenges in designing a system like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so I think, um, so I think one thing to, to think about, so this is like a programming interface basically. So you need to think about um, what, um, uh, you know, what do people, what benefits do people get from it versus what they have to learn or give up in order to use it? Because it sort of constrains how they work as they do it. So uh, that's why we, we actually um, uh, started by looking at what do the, the people who build the models or who build the data preparation code want to do uh, and make sure that it provides some value to them. Um, and once they're willing to do it, you know, that means that other people can understand kind of, can, can, can use the information that we recorded there and, and can do additional stuff with it. Um, and the, so, so I think that's one way to, to think about it. Uh, uh, there's a similar thing if you think about the, like let's say the packaging format, right? How hard is it to write a, a serving system that knows how to read that format? And if you, it needs to like, 
it needs to be powerful enough to save a lot of models, but it also needs to be uh, adoptable by other people so that they're willing to spend, you know, a week or two weeks or whatever to integrate with it. Um, and I think, I mean, other than that, I would say um, you you have to, I mean, it's, it's always, they're always like, you know, you're trying to define a number of abstractions and usually if you can have fewer abstractions and fewer like tuning knobs on each one, that's going to be easier to understand. Um, so you have to think about like how to factor things that way. Um, yeah, yeah this, this sounds great. And it's actually a topic that I'm really, I really care about, like finding the right abstraction is something, uh -huh. you know, um, I think there's a lot of ingenuity that needs to go into finding that right abstraction. What do you think about the idea of, in general, I would say, you know, when you find the right abstraction, maybe you could open up the black box for some users mm -hmm. at the same time, nudging some other users towards not like setting the, the parameters of these knobs to some default uh, reasonable defaults and, you know, uh, to strike like a balance between allowing expert users to use the full power and allowing unexpert users mm -hmm. to use the system more easily. Yeah, I, I think that that's a good idea in general. The only downside I would say with that is that anything you expose as an interface, you probably want to uh, maintain going forward. So, uh, so if you if you are too hasty and you put something that kind of locks you in in the future, uh, then then you might uh, regret that later. And you know the cost of it is you have to maintain it, and it creates confusion for anyone who reads about the thing. They're like, what is this? You know. So, um, but uh, you know, one example of that is what what we had with logging. Uh, you know, we wanted to have auto logging in a lot of libraries, but we knew that it, it would take a while to build that and it wouldn't capture everything. So we also had this low level API for, uh, for logging things. Um, and the same is for querying and so on. If the UI doesn't let you click around to see things, you can always uh, query it using, uh, like just pull out a data frame and, and search on it. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing I'll say with this is, you know, it's, it's also for something like this, it's nice if it gets out of the way when you're not worried about that right now. So we don't want everyone to have to spend like a week learning MLflow to use it. We want it to be, you know, quite quick to get started with. And then when you are doing something complicated, like exploring the 1 million models and seeing which one's doing better, then you can spend some time to learn how to do that. Um, but it's, I, I should, again, even with something like with a very simple interface like this, it, it has a huge impact on like what people can build. Like in companies like Google and Uber, like, you know, basically all the machine learning applications get built on those platforms. Um, and it's, it's way easier to maintain them and so on. So it's, it's still an impactful thing, even if it's small. Yeah. So we just had a question about how do you uh, look into failure modes with MLflow? And mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I was thinking about in the talk actually was, uh, you know, thinking back to the presentation that we had la last week from Marco about checklists. Um, how do you think about uh, letting, what interfaces and tools do you give people to kind of explore how their models are failing or yeah, maybe to test to yeah. some places where they don't know that something is failing? Yeah, so that's, I think this is the great thing about the combination of re recording a lot of stuff and having this very general interface to models. So you can you can write like a very, you know, short Python script, for example, that's going to, you know, load all the versions of a model you had in the past and run them on some test data set and like do something with the results uh, without having to know like how they were written, you know, was, which, which ML library was it written in? Which language was it using R or Python? Uh, which uh, library dependencies? Because you have that portable packaging format. So the way we envision people doing this is, um, you know, it's, it's easy to log a model into that packaging format. And then it's very easy to create tools on top that compare them and, you know, do anything that's like black box with them. If you wanted to understand the weights inside and stuff, that's harder. Uh, although even then you could look at the flavors and uh, pull out the weights from something you understand. Um, but uh, that's kind of how, how we're viewing it. And, and we definitely see people doing this. Uh, also people going back and saying, wait, which models were trained using this data set because it was corrupt at that time or, or whatever. Um, yeah, so I think you, you, you have to start by, that, that's like one of the most important APIs or interfaces is uh, how do I call, how do I load and call this model on some new data? And that's something we have to design like a little 
type system for it, some way to launch it, you know, some ways to make that efficient. Uh, so there's a little bit of like system design that went in there. Uh, Matei, could you comment on how MLflow lets you kind of profile the pipeline that, that you build on top of it? So let's find mm -hmm. out where maybe it's it's slow, what can be improved, what can be optimized. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's not really something where um, kind of optimizing for, but you do get to see if you organize your work as a bunch of these like project ones, as these independent modules, then that gives you a nice way to profile it uh, because you can see when each one ran and how it's been trending over time. Um, so again, I think one of the most powerful things is you can go and all the stuff I showed in that table, you can query as a data frame or you can send us a little SQL expression. So I can ask, for example, like in the past 20 days, you know, what's the longest it's taken to train this model and what's the, you know, what, what metric did it get and, and whatever. Um, yeah. So given that we have five last minutes, I would actually transition into um, asking you one question, which actually are two questions, really. Um, one is, um, what is next for a MLflow? What other things are you working on, and what should users expect from like the next release? What are the new exciting mm -hmm. things that are that are there? And also, in general, what are you know the next the future directions that you are exploring in the intersection of machine learning and systems. Mm -hmm. I, I want to nudge you towards, if there's something that you want to talk about, maybe to talk about that uh, database OS paper that you- Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That I would be really curious to hear your thoughts about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, so like, let me answer. So with, with MLflow at first, um, uh, uh, there are a few things that we're, um, we're building next that, it, you know, actually tie into like questions that people asked. One of them was um, basically interpretability and comparing models. So you've got all these models. We want to make it very easy to take all of them and uh, pass them into SHAP, for example, and uh, see a comparison of how they predicted stuff on different data points. So that's one of the things we're working on. We have a, a basic version of that got merged that lets you explain like one model basically. Um, and there's also more generally right now, uh, we don't have a very opinionated um, uh, sort of API for feature stores and managing features. So that's one of the things we're thinking about. Uh, and same thing for like, when the model is deployed, can I query metrics about it, how well it's doing, what the inputs look like? Because we have this package and we also know uh, the schema of the model, like the, the parameters it expects and what it returns. We could imagine doing some of that automatically and in a way that's agnostic to what type of model it was. Um, so I'd say these are the next ones there. And more generally, like, yeah, in terms of my research and in my research group, we're doing, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things, I think. So, so one thing I'll, I'll mention, because you, you brought this up, is um, um, I'm, uh, I, I'm interested in, uh, in general, like in um, uh, how do we design distributed systems uh, in, a, in a nice uh, way that's easy to maintain and also easy to optimize. And one pretty cool project that uh, I'm part of recently together with folks at MIT, um, uh, such as Mike Stonebreaker, uh, is, um, is um, uh, this database, data-centric system design. We have a project, uh, DBOS, a database uh, backed operating system where all your state is in uh, is in is in tables and uh, and then all the operations you do on those are like you know small transactions from basically stateless processes and one of the cool things with that is it's very easy to take a system with that and uh, tell it to log all the changes to all the tables and get some information about what it was doing historically. And it's also easy to take that information and train a machine learning model on it and, and you know, tell it to change some records like in, in a table to set some parameters. So it gives you a way to externally manage the tuning of a system. Uh, and it also gives you a lot of nice properties just for engineering. So it's inspired by like what I've seen when people design sort of custom systems from scratch for other things like, you know, job scheduler at Databricks or cluster manager or stuff like that. That's at least one of the sources of inspiration. That's great. Um, so that's, yeah, I think that's a, I'm definitely excited to do more today. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, um, well, we have one minute left. So I'm going to thank you, Matei, for, for uh, giving the talk and taking a lot of questions from the audience. We got uh, a lot of interaction, so that's great. Um, thanks to everybody who joined today. Um, obviously, we're going to be back um, next week. 
Um, if you want to be informed about um, talks, uh, just go to mlsys.stanford.edu and we have a mailing list now. So make sure to sign up. We'll send you um, as few emails as necessary to keep you informed. We're not going to spam you. So make sure to sign up there. Um, and next week, we're going to have Virginia Smith from CMU, who's going to tell us a little bit more about federated learning. Um, and we're very excited to have her uh, come in next week. So thanks to everyone. Thanks, Dan, Peter, Piero and Matei and our audience. Uh, see you guys. Bye.